Hello and welcome uh, to the next session, this opening session for the Horasis Summit. I'm Nick Gowing, I'm in uh, London and uh, I am founder and director of the Thinking the Unthinkable project. And what we're going to be looking at in the next 45 minutes is the shock of the new geopolitical realities. We don't have to list them for you, but what we want to do is discuss them and also give signals as to the way things are going. Broadly, our work at Thinking the Unthinkable says that what we're seeing is stability unravelling. And that's what we were warning about well before COVID, well before the climate emergency, and certainly well before Ukraine. Joining me from Latvia, first of all, is uh, Vara Vika Freiberger, the former president of Latvia. Welcome, uh, Madam President. And from Tokyo, uh, the former foreign minister, Taro Kono. Welcome, Taro. Nice to see you again. We're Thank hoping you. as well to be joined by Ilya Ponomarev, uh, who was in the uh, state Duma in Russia. He was the only politician to vote against Russia seizing and annexing Crimea in 2014. He is now based in Ukraine, but is joining us from somewhere else. I hope he'll be joining us. No sign of him yet. But Madam uh, Freiberger, let me ask you, first of all, and I'd like to ask both of you to be quite brief on this at the moment. What is your assessment of the level of shock that geopolitical realities are now facing? I would say that it's, uh, it's about as high as it can get, because uh, many, uh, especially those living in democratic countries, uh, in spite of, of the list of ills and threats facing the world today, uh, did not expect man-made, uh, willful, deliberate shocks uh, to be facing us, such as uh, that uh, over uh, encirclement and invasion of Ukraine on, on February 24th. We have been reciting the, man, the, the sort of list, the mantra, uh, of the ills facing and the threats, uh, and they are perfectly real. Um, but the idea that somebody uh, in the heart of Europe uh, would start a medieval kind of war, uh, and, and a war which is essentially looks to be aimed at destroying cities and, and killing civilians more than anything else, um, I think that was a shock, and it has occasioned, at least in Europe, a 180-degree change of uh, uh, countries' conceptions about their security and the continent's security uh, within let's, the past couple months. While you have the microphone, though, given what has happened from the, the food summit, which has taken place at the United Nations overnight, with the UN Secretary General warning of essentially hunger and potentially famine, his words, this is where I come back to the stability that we take for granted unraveling the enormous impact, not just on, on Ukraine, but the more the, the, the broader ability of the political class now to handle the scale of multiple threats, multiple challenges to all we take for granted. Uh, we have taken for granted uh, the fact that uh, there is a sort of uh, um, modus operandi uh, that we have uh, a certain multilateralism for years. The, since my presidency, uh, the bodies that I belong to, are former presidents and prime ministers at various think tanks I have interacted with, everybody has been talking about a crucial thing is to have a multilateral world order, a rules-based world order, uh, and then we can uh, we have a hope, a ghost of a hope, of, of tackling everything that faces humanity. Uh, but that rules-based order... Uh, is praying at the at the edges uh, and and even <laughs> having holes in the middle uh, right now. And the domino effects of anything going wrong, such as an, a completely unprovoked invasion of a neighboring country, simply because you decide you don't like it uh, and you want to to, to take it over, uh, the the domino effect of this breadbasket uh, of the world, uh, together with Russia itself. Uh, nobody seems to have, certainly President Putin doesn't seem to have cared about it a bit. And we heard that from the director of the World Food Programme as well, David Beasley, saying that this is now not humanitarian. No one have a humanitarian heart in Russia. Let me go to uh, Konasan. Welcome, Taro. Nice to see you. Um, see give you. us the perspective from Tokyo, from, from the Asia, from Asia, um, particularly what you're seeing in China, what you're seeing in North Korea as well, and what you're seeing around the area, particularly as the markets are falling, this, this whole overall complexity, complexion of stability and how it's unraveling. Thank you. Well, in Asia, 
it, ha- it has been、uh, China and the possible invasion of Taiwan. And、uh, we we have been worried about the situation. And as a foreign minister, I was involved in a peace treaty negotiation between Japan and Russia, and、uh, we were trying to resolve the issue of Northern Territory and create a better relationship with Russia. And hopefully,、uh, we were trying to make G7 into G8 again.、Uh, but、uh, this thing happened, and、uh, all the hopes were dashed. Well, China has been expanding their military. Uh, for many years, in last thirty years, their military spending increased forty-two fold, I believe, and、uh, they are continuing to try to invade the airspace of Taiwan and the airspace of Japan and territorial waters. So we need to be prepared if t- China takes some action to reunite with Taiwan. Uh, it may not be just a kinetic warfare; it could be economic coercion, and、uh, we thought we need to be prepared. So now, Chinese Communist Party and、uh, its leadership is closely monitoring the situation in Ukraine and how the international community、uh, put the sanction against the Russia. They must be calculating what would be the cost of their invasion of Taiwan. If the cost is too much,、uh, they may back off from uh, reuniting uh, with Taiwan. So this is very critical moment, and、uh, what's going on in Ukraine has a very significant implication in East Asia. So we、uh, we need to be prepared. I believe if we all believe there's a possibility of China trying to reunite with Taiwan, then we need to be prepared to do some kind of economic sanction on China. But unlike Russia, whose economy is somewhat isolated except the energy sector, Chinese economy they're they're very much intertwined in a global supply chain. Taro, can I can I just interrupt you and, and ask you to pick up what、uh, President Freiberger said, particularly the challenge now, the threat to the rule ba- the rules based system, just that overarching theme of stability unraveling and what lies ahead, and the speed at which it's happening, and the ability of the political class to handle it. Well, we saw the Security Council of the United Nations has turned into just a talking forum. They have not been able to take any significant. Action because of the veto、uh, by Russia and China. So,、uh, rule-based international order,、uh, we cannot enforce if there's anyone violating the situation. So, I believe we need to upgrade United Nations and maybe like-minded country who have a common values such as freedom, democracy, rule,、uh, rule of law. We may have to come up with some kind of framework、uh, so that if there's a violation of fundamental values, we all need to、uh, get together and uh, uh, fend off threat coming from dictatorship. But do you believe there is a mood for that, a practical ability to do that? Well, right now, I don't think we are still talking about the United Nations reform yet. But、uh, among the like-minded country, I think there's a sort of movement. Finland, Sweden joining NATO. There's a talk of form- forming something like NATO-like organization in Asia is necessary. Even in Japan, we are now changing the security posture. We are talking about a new framework. So I think people are beginning to see. The rule-based international order may might have come to the end, and、right. we may have to be prepared for something new. All right. Let me invite.、Uh, we have a number of people w-、um, watching us, monitoring us, listening to us. If you'd like to ask a question or just make a point, please put it in the the chat line, and I'll I'll bring it up、uh, because we have thirty five minutes to run, and I'd like to get other views as well.、Uh, Madam Freiberger, you have a long and distinguished career. You're an academic now. And、uh, obviously, you've retired from political life. But when you look at the political class, 
and what you went through in, in Latvia, particularly in the post-Soviet time, when you look at the ability of the political class globally, and it's difficult to generalize, their ability now to see, to sense the threat to what they've taken for granted and their ability or not to handle it and to move forward in a positive way, which can reverse some of these very negative trends. Blindness uh, has always been selective, I think, uh, among, uh, among leaders. Uh, the, the interests of any country and any region uh, have always uh, shone through uh, any kind of international gathering or meeting. Uh, at the time when Kofi Annan was Secretary General of the United Nations, he uh, took a serious uh, decision uh, to do something about reforming this institution. Uh, for instance, one of the aspects uh, of it was that it had thousands of projects funded by the United Nations internationally that nobody had ever followed up, uh, evaluated their efficiency, or checked whether they were still needed. Uh, I was one of five people whom he named ambassadors for the reform of the uh, United Nations, and we thought, we, uh, never mind the Security Council, the, the sacred cow, uh, and, and, and the one thing that makes this uh, organization useless as far as uh, um, being uh, keeping... Uh, uh, re respect uh, for international treaties and, 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 and even the Charter of the United Nations, uh, as we just saw this year uh, in February. But how about the projects that the United Nations has across the world? And it didn't take very long uh, before um, there was uh, a, a grouping of different minded, if you like, like minded countries. Uh, the European Union countries and and countries sort of either democratic or or you know working towards establishing the democracy said yes uh, there should be I mean it's it's obvious you have uh, international projects billions are being spent let us evaluate how many of them are obsolete uh, how many should be closed and new ones started and immediately. Uh, a group of countries was, was formed, the 77 first and 135 later, I forget numbers. But these were countries who, former colonies of, say, of some European powers, or former uh, uh, allies who had been working with Soviet Russia and, and receiving the military and, and financial aid. And there was immediately a grouping of anti-reform countries uh, that would simply vote against anything in the as uh, assembly that was proposed by those who wanted reform. So you see this sort of schism uh, on, on any idea on the world scale. I guess you see it all the time. You have the right and the left in France, which seems to be, uh, they can't breathe without referring to the right being, you know, you're either left or you're right, and it's sort of horribly important where you stand. Um, but this makes it difficult to change things, of course. Uh, not that it's impossible. Of course, it's not impossible, but it does make it difficult. Let me, um, we have no comments at the moment, and Ilya hasn't managed to join us from wherever he is. Um, what I'd like to do is go down into a granular uh, level here, because both of you have had the experience of negotiating with Russia. Um, Madam Freiberger, when you were president of Latvia, you were negotiating over a border treaty. And uh, Taro, as you just mentioned, you were negotiating over the islands. Don't go into too much detail, but given that at some point, at some point, there will have to be maybe not peace between Ukraine and Russia, but some kind of understanding uh, of uh, certainly uh, end to hostilities. And look where we are with Korea still. What is it like dealing with Russia and how much do you believe them in their negotiations? First of all, Madam Freiberger, you're dealing a border with a border treaty problem. We had, I think that the border treaty in many ways uh, was not uh, for us uh, as a country, was not uh, a crucial aspect. The important thing for us had been in the early 90s, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, to manage to get the withdrawal of Red Army troops, uh, more than 80,000 of them, uh, away from our territory and back to Russia. And this, in this, the American president at the time, it was Bill Clinton, uh, and his advisors uh, dealt with, with President Yeltsin, 
uh, in a very energetic way. We could not have uh, done that alone, but the three Baltic countries uh, managed uh, uh, to get a signature from President Yeltsin. Uh, and, and the treaty was signed by my predecessor, President Ullmans, uh, whereby uh, the, uh, all those military personnel who had been brought to Latvia as occupying, as an occupying force for 50 years after all, uh, they, uh, they were to withdraw, uh, but we were, uh, we would keep those who had retired, old age pensioners, and of course, massively, immediately as the, as the treaty was signed, uh, um, 20,000 people took early retirement from the Russian army and we were stuck with them here in Latvia, but we were ready <laughs> to accept, to accept that and to pay their pensions till the end of their lives. Uh, but just to ensure that we did not have a foreign occupying army or territory. That was much more important. And the, uh, the treaty, yes, they, uh, Putin, who has said that they annexed Crimea because it was given to Ukraine only under the Soviet Union, and that didn't count, he, uh, he wanted a part of Latvia, 5% of our territory, that was taken away by Stalin during the civil period. And he said, but that did count. So in Latvia's case, what happened in Stalin's time counted. And we did give up 5% of our territory just to make sure that we had no quarrel with our neighbor and that this would be not a barrier uh, in our application to NATO because to us, that was much more important than anything else. And quickly, is there anything to learn from what you went through personally uh, in this negotiation about where we could end up on a deal, on an arrangement uh, for coexistence, and I'm using my words carefully here, between I think that the, and Russia. The, the demands that Russia has never cease. Uh, I uh, had an early meeting with President Putin soon after he was elected by to expressing our goodwill uh, and, and uh, uh, answering to Russia's complaints that after the collapse of the Soviet Union, so many of his compatriots uh, of Russians were stuck in various countries that were now not Russia, that were independent countries, and what a tragedy this was. He said that right after being elected. And I tried to tell him that uh, this need not be a tragedy. Uh, and certainly for us, it was a happy day when the Soviet Union collapsed and, 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 and could be handled. But he's not a man whom you can trust. Uh, he understands strength. Uh, and he understands uh, uh, counterforce. He only stops when he sees that he has to, for instance, when it, just like Yeltsin did when uh, Bill Clinton was very, very strong in his position. Uh, and uh, much as um, Yeltsin uh, kept saying, oh, Bill, you're a friend of mine. And, you know, you please uh, promise me that, that you will never uh, extend NATO and things like that. Um, Bill Clinton did not promise that to Yeltsin. All right. Well, look, let's hear the Japanese experience, particularly over the islands, uh, Taro Kono. Uh, and you've had recently, uh, I think, Russian warships who have been testing the waters again during this recent uh, tension. Nothing connected to Ukraine, but it's mm -hmm. an interesting display of assertive military power. What was your experience negotiating with Russia? And it's really still unresolved. Yes, over more than half a century, Japan and Russia uh, talking about these four islands north of uh, Hokkaido. And uh, things are not moving at all. And then Prime Minister Abe agreed with President Putin to speed up the peace treaty process, which involved four islands. So I was a chief negotiator for Japan, and my counterpart was Foreign Minister Lavrov. Although President Putin agreed with Prime Minister Abe to speed up the process, uh, the negotiation with the Russian Foreign Ministry is not moving forward at all. They're always going back to some historical questions, which has nothing to do with peace treaty and uh, negotiations being bogged down. And uh, we always had to move it up to the Prime Minister present level. Uh, but uh, it's been very slow. And uh, well, with this invasion of Ukraine, the peace treaty negotiation is 
well, it's the end of it. I think we need to really uh, do it uh, post Putin era. So nothing really materialized from the negotiation. Uh, we have been talking about uh, infrastructure investment uh, into Russia separately, but uh, that thing is not moving uh, along at all. And uh, except a certain uh, gas and oil project, uh, which we have not yet uh, decided what we're going to do with, uh, there were not much inroad into uh, Russian economy. So whatever Putin said uh, didn't carry. We believe because Putin is a very strong leader, uh, maybe he is the right person to negotiate a territorial issue uh, so he can bring it through Duma and others. But uh, I'm not sure if he had a real intention to bring it through. But let me ask you, I mean, you mentioned Lavrov there, therefore you sat across the table with him. He's been foreign minister for 18 years. Can I ask both of you, what are you dealing with? Because I don't need to requote some of the stuff he said over Ukraine, but some of it has been quite extraordinary for a seasoned diplomat, a former ambassador at the United Nations, and really quite disarming and deeply disturbing and quite sinister. Therefore, who do you believe when you're dealing with Russia? First of all, um, Madam President. Well, I've had, uh, I, I think uh, I sat at the same dinner table under the stars uh, in the Topkapi uh, Gardens at the Istanbul uh, uh, NATO summit. And uh, w- what I noticed is that Mr. Lavrov uh, seemed uh, very put out, you see, at being at the same table with me, uh, but not quite uh, as put out uh, as uh, as President Putin, when in 2007, Koti- Kofi Annan, uh, sat me uh, at the at the luncheon given by the Secretary General of the United Nations together with the American President. Kofi Annan had uh, George Bush sitting to his right. He sat me to his left, and then there was an empty chair. There was uh, Jacques Chirac sitting there and the King of Spain, and an empty chair. And then we saw President Putin arriving, and 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 the look on his face is is something that of course i shall cherish my whole life because it was he was simply absolutely appalled uh, at the idea of of having to sit at the head table the table of honor next to the president of a small neighboring country whom he would have loved to intimidate and to ignore and and, and everything else the the man has <laughs> if you like he has a mania of grandeurs that goes back uh, to to uh, the imperial and Stalinist times uh, of both the Russian Empire and the uh, and the Soviet times, which he has been emulating more and more and looking back into into history, so that he is uh, and I could name you some other countries for whom grandeur and power and strength uh, and 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 prestige. Are, are extremely important. And I, I, I must say that uh, I am, uh, as a psychologist formerly in my training, I am surprised at the uh, missteps that he has engaged in by, by this full, complete invasion of Ukraine on, on February 24th. Uh, because he, he should have, one would have thought that he would have anticipated how that would proceed, but it seems that he did not evaluate either his strength or that of Ukraine or, or the West. Uh, neither did Western experts, so I suppose everybody mis- misunderstood and miscalculated, which just means how difficult it is to proceed in an unpredictable world on on information that is always probably, uh, you interpret it as probably true, but you can never be 100% sure until it is confirmed. So it is and, like treading on, on thin ice all the time. And one has to it. Excuse me, Kunasan, let me ask you, I mean, geopolitical realities are also the human contacts between those representing governments, including governments at war. And that's why I pick on Lavrov, who's been there 18 years. And as I say, particularly his comment about Hitler and Jewish, the Jewish connection was quite extraordinary. But what, what is the geopolitical reality about dealing with both Russia and also China at the moment? Well, unlike Latvia, we don't share uh, land borders with Russia. So my experience may be a little bit different. 
I have been speaking with uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov for many times. He may be a interesting person to have a lunch or dinner with privately. He often tells jokes in English. Uh, sometimes he's quite unique. Uh, but uh, when we really do business, my feeling is he may not have much room to maneuver. Uh, he may have to play by the book. So I, I, I think uh, it, it may be more difficult to make something happen in negotiation in uh, official terms. I think he needs to go back to uh, President Putin and then come back and get things moving. So uh, he, he may not have much room to maneuver. That is uh, understanding. And for Russia, I think it's not the system. It's President Putin. It's a personality, and everyone is his follower. He can fire uh, a- anything, uh, anyone he wants. China is different. China, although there's a Xi Jinping and he's a very strong leader, but China has a structure. It's a communist party. Uh, the Communist Party ruled the China. So it's not just uh, Xi Jinping himself. He has power, but uh, there's a limit to it. So dealing with China and dealing with Russia is quite different. And dealing with Russia, you have to deal, in, you have to deal with President Putin. But China, you are dealing with Xi Jinping and Communist Party. So there's a difference. And I think that's that's a major uh, difference, I think. I've got uh, one request uh, for the microphone from Amdeep uh, Mida. Uh, Amandeep, can you come in, please? Can you hear me? Can you come in? Amandeep, no, you're not registering at the moment. Uh, um, Amadeep, I can see you, yes. Quickly, hi, uh, um, can, you, can you give a brief comment, please, only? We have limited time. My, my question is about, like, the countries which have been playing neutral, like, for example, India. Can they not be used to actually draw the peaceful conclusion to what is going on? Do you agree that uh, India is neutral in all of this? Tarakono. And then, uh, Ananda Setio, could you stand by, please? Uh, well, we understand India's position is uh, very particular. Uh, India purchased uh, fighter jet and other weapon system from Russia, and they are depending on spare parts coming from Russia to fly their air force. So we understand uh, India at the moment is not able to take stand. But uh, I think uh, West need to get more support from the international uh, community. We need to uh, address the issue of food security and energy security of many countries. We need to alleviate the pain that they are suffering. And uh, this Russian invasion, it's unprovoked and it's totally illegal. So it should not be go unpunished. But uh, many countries are wavering in between. So I think the West need to uh, extend our hand to support them and alleviate the pain that they are going through. And Kono said I should just pick up on that because we haven't really talked about it and we must because it is a massive unthinkable and a massive challenge in these new realities, the global climate emergency and the position of India there, particularly uh, it's uh, it's vital necessity of producing energy um, at the moment um, to to meet demand. What's your view of the view that uh, of the position that Modi has been taking? Well, India wants to go carbon neutral by twenty seventy, I believe, and uh, we need India to move forward. So I think we need to work together uh, installing more renewable technology in India. Uh, the Indian private companies are getting in touch with Japanese government and Japanese company uh, for assistance. They have intention to move forward, but it's a huge country with so many people. Uh, I, we understand it is not easy, but uh, we definitely need India to uh, get to carbon neutral before 2070 to save this planet. And uh, same thing for China as well.
India, China is too giant in Asia. And if they are not moving forward, other small country would say, why do we have to uh, put so much effort uh, if those two countries are not doing? So I think it is very important for us to closely work with India and uh, bring them in. Uh, President Freiberger, quickly on India, your, your reflection, please. India is in no ways a, a, a neutral country politically. Uh, it has decades-long associations with, uh, with the Soviet Union, uh, which, which were carried over uh, to uh, the Russian Federation after the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, politically, it has, uh, uh, it has uh, uh, been, if you like, neutral as not being supportive of, of the Western world, uh, not openly hostile to it either, but definitely having close ties and sympathies uh, with with both Soviet Union and, and now uh, the Russian Federation. So politically, as intermediate leaders, they're completely out because they're not neutral. However, they're crucial and they're important in these other aspects that uh, that Mr. Kono just uh, described. And, and certainly, I think uh, when I mentioned Ukraine uh, together with Russia as a sort of brain basket for the world as far as wheat is concerned. I, the contribution of India here uh, to, to world food production and, and, and the alleviation of, of potential hunger is, is extremely crucial. And the heat wave that India is uh, experiencing right at this moment uh, threatens to be, to be a catastrophe. And I think that this is where, where worldwide the, the, the UN institutions uh, I think need to really get much more active, for instance, in irrigation programs and, and, and various ways of countering the disastrous effects of, of climate change on, on food production. For instance, we have had floods in, uh, in Kada, uh, on in the wheat producing regions uh, in Saskatchewan, where, where so much wheat is grown. As well, there have been floods, literally uh, fields turned into lakes. So in these aspects and in the uh, climate change in terms of carbon neutral progress, uh, India uh, remains a, a country uh, that but one needs to have it participating and in, in fact leading in a great many fields which are of world importance. Thank you very much. Uh, let me move to Ananda Setio Ivananto. Uh, Ananda, where are you? Can you come in with the microphone, please? I have no no control over this, but I'm uh, pressing buttons and hoping that Ananda, <laughs> you are coming to the microphone. Yes, I can see you. So oh, speak. Okay. You you are now connected. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so my name is uh, Ivan. I'm from uh, Ewing Group. Uh, it's uh, actually a joint venture between Japan and Indonesia, and we are heavily exposed in the field of clean energy and also environment for the past more than twelve years. So thank you very much for the opportunity. So uh, I just would like to have uh, so how do you must I know yours very much. Thank you very much. Uh, so I have a question about the Indonesian position uh, related to these new geop geopolitical realities. As you know, the G20 is happening in Indonesia this year and the chairmanship of Indonesia in ASEAN next year. So I just have this crazy idea. Can we just invite Putin and Zelensky to Bali and let's, you know, discuss about these issues and find a way to solve the problem? I mean, because I remember the times when Trump and uh, Kim Jong-un came to Singapore and, you know, basically they met to discuss. Do you think that... Indonesia should have a more stronger, uh, proactive stance to, you know, basically see the ways, seek the ways to resolve these geopolitical issues. Right. So how do you study right. position in Indonesia? Thank you yeah, very and much. Kono-san, if you can also uh, address the issue of Indonesia's role, but also it being a significant player when it comes to the need for action on sustainability and net zero. In other words, it's got to show leadership on the climate emergency as well. Yes. yes, thank you. Well, it's a very wild idea. Uh, yeah, just like uh, President Trump meeting Kim Jong-un in Singapore. Well, I wonder if they would, well, I think Zelensky would come, but uh, Putin may not. Well, uh, I think we, we have to remember Putin should be tried for war criminal. Uh, so, well, it is necessary to have them talk to each other to stop the fighting. But uh, if the fighting is over, what are we, how are we going to deal with Putin personally? Uh, I think that's a global issue. And Indonesia is very important in terms of climate change. 
we understand Indonesia has a resource like uh, cheap coal, and uh, they could use coal for the economic growth if there's no climate uh, issues. But uh, I think we need to ask Indonesia to move into uh, renewable energy. Well, Japan, Japan's METI used to have a crazy idea of selling coal power plant to Indonesia, saying this is most modern technology, which is much dirtier than natural gas. And oh, finally, uh, we decided to against it. So uh, supporting Indonesia is definitely a big issue. Uh, right now in Asia, China, India, Indonesia, Japan, Australia, I think we need to take care of this uh, issue. Indonesia, because of the sheer population, uh, it's going to be a major economic power sooner or later. And Japan's declining in terms of a population. So I wouldn't be surprised sometime in 21st century that Indonesia GDP may uh, become bigger than Japan. All right. So well, let me, we let, let, me put that, let me put that to President Freiberg. I want to get another couple of questions in. We've got nine minutes to go. President Freiberger, the importance of a country like Indonesia being the, uh, the chair of the G20, um, showing the, the shift that there is. One of the big geopolitical realities is the shift in power to a country like Indonesia in a year like this. I think the, the shift and the importance of Indonesia, uh, certainly, I think, is something that is worthwhile drawing to the world's attention. Uh, uh, the, the economic development uh, and the contributions to climate change, again, for a country of that size, is crucial. I would, uh, uh, as a nature lover, I would uh, express concern uh, about the, uh, the disappearance of uh, various uh, ecosystems and, and animal species that are unique to this region uh, because of the export of, of uh, uh, the, the cutting down of forests uh, and, and the uh, very valuable woods uh, that are being destroyed. Uh, precisely in the same manner that President Bolsonaro, again, a large country, a very important country, but President Bolsonaro is, to, to my understanding, uh, acting very irresponsibly uh, towards the, the uh, environment and, and the Amazon as, as the breathing lungs uh, of our planet. But Indonesia, too, is part of that. Uh, as far as uh, getting, uh, again, here of uh, being a political intermediary, sorry, um, uh, of course, Indonesia, if I understand, is inviting both, both uh, certainly they, they are inviting President Putin. Uh, whether he will travel, there are various uh, reasons why he may or may not. Uh, but the point is, uh, pre uh, President Putin has, uh, as far as intermediary and having a debate between them and solving the problem, a man who has accused Zelensky uh, himself, being from a Jewish family, of being a Nazi, uh, and of needing to be purged uh, as, as the illegitimate leader uh, of a country that shouldn't exist uh, and should be wiped off the face of the earth. Frankly, that is not uh, a promising basis uh, for getting some sort of negotiated solution. It, it's clear that force is the only thing that will decide the issue. Right. Let me, uh, we have seven minutes to run. Thomas Wu, can you grab the microphone and um, however you do that? But what I'd also like to put to uh, uh, Konosan and also President Freiberger is the fact that we are now facing, if we'd been talking three or four months ago, we wouldn't be talking like this. But we are facing an enormous economic shock, quite apart from the shortage of food. Inflation at eight, nine, ten percent. You know what the IMF and the World Bank are warning about now. And the, 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 the warning from the Bank of England governor this week that what we face is apocalyptic. Now, th this is language we couldn't have imagined six or seven months ago. And I just ask you for, for some final thoughts in a couple of minutes about this, about the ability of the political class to handle this. We last went through it 40 years and many 40 years ago, many people on this uh, on this webcast won't have even been aware of what happening 40 years ago. But for those of us who went through the uh, adversary, the, the, uh, the, the difficulties of stagflation, inflation, and uh, the uncertainties economically, it was a deeply troubling time. So let me just take this question from Thomas Wu. Thomas, are you there? I can't see you. All right. Well, um, President Freiberger and, and Gunnarsson, can you just answer that issue about the ability to handle the enormity of change in the world economy now 
which is going to be incredibly difficult, very tough, particularly for the poor. It's going to be uh, enormously difficult. We are seeing already uh, much more rapid uh, inflation, I think, as, as had been expected. And you remember it from the 19, from 40 years ago. Yes, and, and, and everybody is, is thinking back to also the, the 30s and the rise of Adolf Hitler because of the hyperinflation that, that Germany was uh, submitted to. Any time you have inflation or hyperinflation, of course, the stability of any political system uh, is, is absolutely threatened. But I think one of the aspects about the, the current economic situation is not just the inequality of resources uh, across the, 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 the planet, uh, but within each country, and including economically developed countries, the Gini index keeps rising uh, decade after decade and year after year. And the rich get colossally richer. Uh, and, and the poor in, in many countries that are supposed to be rich countries are left out on the street, which is what you see in the United States of America, a rich and powerful country. But the number of the homeless out in the streets of America is simply appalling. So that there is something definitely wrong uh, with the distribution of wealth uh, that is happening in the world. And I must say that President Putin seems to have found a, a rather original way, for instance, of dealing with his oligarchs, whom, the, whom many, many commentators have thought the oligarchs might put pressure on him because of the sanctions uh, to, to stop the war in Ukraine. Uh, six or seven of these people since February 24th have... Uh, first of all, uh, um, murdered, cut up their wife and, and daughter with an axe and, and shot themselves, uh, uh, cut up their son and, 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 and wife and, and so on, uh, and then hanged themselves. In other words, there have been these uh, um, theatrically, theatrically scary uh, murder-suicide uh, events among the richest uh, oligarchs surrounding President Putin, and uh, if that is not uh, a gesture of intimidation towards the super-rich in his country, I don't know what else. Uh, Colonel, might... Colonel, sir, would you and mind if I just... Ladies and gentlemen, I am not recommending that as the universal solution to the world's economic problems. Obviously, that is not the way to do it. Colonel, sir, we had literally three minutes, so, uh, and Thomas, I'm hoping I sort of partly guess what your question might be about the global economy. So can you bear with me? We can see you now, but Colonel, sir, do you believe um, that the, the, the world leaders and the geopolitical realities can cope with the enormity of what we now face and speed uh, of what is happening economically? Well, I guess we have to. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be a real disaster. But uh, it takes political will. It takes uh, the government and the opposition to work together. Uh, in Japan, because with the low interest rate, low inflation, the government uh, pretend that there's no budget deficit. And uh, we just kept the interest rate to zero. So the government could keep borrowing from the Bank of Japan. Now with the FRB raising interest rate, uh, Bank of Japan need to probably follow, but they cannot do that. So that's why the yen starts sliding to 130 yen to a dollar now. So now we need to tighten the belt. We need to cut the expenditure. We may have to talk about uh, pension reform and, you know, those things that is not a... Uh, not a beautiful uh, song to the voters, but uh, I think the government need to work with opposition. So what 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 is tested is uh, politicians' ability to work uh, beyond the party. If the government and the opposition could work together to solve the problem, and can we do that across the country? All right, uh, that is tested right now. Thank you very much indeed. I really do not want to stop the discussion. We've been talking for 45 minutes. Ilya didn't join us. He wanted to talk, uh, though, about a number of things, particularly about the impact of Russia on European security. Uh, Kornosan, we were going to talk as well about dictatorships around the world. Um, so there were many other things we should have talked about, including, and I'm going to end on this, the global climate emergency, where uh, Guterres said at the launch of the IPCC reports uh, about four weeks ago, he said, Many countries, many governments and many corporates are lying 
on what they are doing to try to prevent a global climate catastrophe. Can I thank you both very much indeed for joining me and for everyone else uh, for being part of this. And I'm sure I echo what Frank Richter will be telling you as well. Thank you very much indeed. Bye-bye. Thank you.